order. Personal statement, Robin Cook. This is the first time for 20 years that I have addressed the House from the back benches. I must confess, I'd forgotten how much better the view is from here. And none of those 20 years were more enjoyable or more rewarding than the past two, in which I've had the immense privilege of serving this House as Leader of the House, which were made all the more enjoyable, Mr Speaker, by the opportunity of working closely with yourself. I have chosen to address the House on why I cannot support a war without international agreement or domestic support. The present Prime Minister is the most successful leader of the Labour Party in my lifetime. I hope that he will continue to be the leader of our party and I hope that he continues to be successful. I have no sympathy with and will give no comfort to those who want to use this crisis to displace him, I applaud. The heroic efforts the Prime Minister has made in trying to secure a second resolution, I do not think. Anybody could have done better in trying to secure a second resolution in the Security Council. But the very intensity of those attempts underlines how important it was to succeed and now that those attempts have failed, we cannot pretend that getting a second resolution was of no importance. France has been at the receiving end of bucket loads of commentary in the last few days. But it is not just France that wants more time for inspections. Russia wants more time for inspections. Germany wants more time for inspections. In fact, at no point have we even had the minimum necessary to carry a second resolution in the Security Council. And we delude ourselves if we think the degree of international hostility is all the fault of President Chirac. The reality is that we are being asked to embark on a war that has none of the backing of the international bodies of which we are a leading partner. Not NATO, not the European Union, and now not the Security Council. To end up in such diplomatic weakness is a serious Reverse. Only one year ago, us and the US were part of a coalition against terrorism that was more wide-ranging and diverse than even I would have imagined possible. History will be astonished at the diplomatic miscalculations that led so quickly to the disintegration of such a powerful coalition. The US can afford to go it alone, but England, Scotland, Britain is not a superpower. Our interests are best protected not by unilateral action, but by multilateral agreement and a world order governed by rules. Yet, tonight, the international partnerships most important to us are weakened. The European Union is split. The Security Council is in stalemate. These are heavy casualties of a war in which a shot has yet to be fired. I have heard parallels between the military action in this circumstance and the military action we took in Kosovo. There is no doubt about the multilateral support we had for the action in Kosovo. It was supported by the European Union. It was supported by NATO. It was supported by every single one of the seven neighbors in the region. France and Germany were our active allies. And it is precisely because we have none of that support in this case that it was vital we got an agreement at the Security Council to at least show hope at last of some international agreement. The legal basis of going to war in Kosovo was that we were responding to an urgent and compelling humanitarian need. The problem we have now is that neither the international community nor the British public are persuaded that there is an urgent and compelling need for military action in Iraq. The threshold for war should always be high. None of us can predict the numbers of casualties in the forthcoming bombardment of Iraq. 
and a US warning of a bombing campaign that will shock and awe makes it likely that the casualties will be numbered in more than the thousands. Ready? I am confident that servicemen and service women will conduct themselves with professionalism and courage. I hope they come back. I hope even now that Saddam will quit Iraq and avert war. But of course, it is false to say that those, that only those who support war will support our troops. It is perfectly legitimate to support our troops while at the same time trying to find an alternative for the conflict that places those troops in danger. Nor is it fair to accuse those of us who want to wait longer for inspections of not having an alternative strategy. For four years as Foreign Secretary, I was partly responsible for the Western strategy of containment. Over the past decade, that strategy destroyed more weapons than in the Gulf War, dismantled Iraq's nuclear weapons program, and halted Saddam's medium and long-range missiles programs. Iraq's military strength is now less than half its size than at the time of the last Gulf War. Ironically, it is only because Iraq's military forces are so weak that we can even contemplate its invasion. In fact, some advocates of the conflict claim that its forces are so weak, are so demoralized, and are so short on supplies that the war will be over in a matter of days. We cannot base our military strategy on the assumption that Saddam is weak and at the same time justify preemptive action on the claim that he is a threat. Why is it now so urgent to take military action against a military power that has been there for 20 years and which we helped create? Why must we go to war this week, while Saddam's ambition to complete his weapons program is blocked by the presence of UN inspectors? Only a couple of weeks ago, Hans Blix told the Security Council that the key remaining disarmament tasks could be completed within months. I have heard it said that Iraq has had not months, but 12 years in which to complete disarmament, and that our patience is exhausted. Yet, it is more than 30 years since Resolution 242 called on Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories, and we do not express the same impatience with the persistent refusal of Israel to comply. I welcome the strong personal commitment that the Prime Minister has given to Middle East peace, but Britain's positive role in the Middle East does not redress the strong sense of injustice throughout the Muslim world at what they see as one rule for the allies of the US and another rule for the rest. is our credibility helped by the appearance that our partners in Washington are less interested in disarmament than they are in regime change in Iraq. And that explains why any evidence that inspections are showing progress is greeted in Washington not with satisfaction but with consternation because it reduces the case for war. What has come to trouble me most over the past weeks is the suspicion that if the hanging chads in Florida had gone the other way and Al Gore had been elected, we would not now be about to commit British troops. The longer that I've served in this place, the greater respect I have for the good sense and collective wisdom of the British people. On Iraq, I believe that the prevailing mood of the people is sound. They do not doubt that Saddam is a brutal dictator, but they are not persuaded that he is a clear and present danger to Britain. They want inspections to be given a chance, because they feel that they are being pushed into a conflict by a US administration with an agenda of its own. I am proud to come to this city, a 
as a guest of your distinguished mayor. I was shown throughout the world the fighting spirit of West Berlin. 2,000 years ago, the proudest boast was Civus Romanus Sum. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is Ich bin ein From the start of this present crisis, as leader of the House, I have insisted upon the right of this place to vote on whether Britain should go to war or not. It has been a favourite theme of commentators that this House no longer occupies a central role in British politics. Nothing could better demonstrate that they are wrong than for this House to vote against a war that has neither international backing nor domestic support. I intend to join those tomorrow who will vote to stop military action now. And it is for that reason, and for that reason alone, and with a heavy heart, that I resign from the government. Thank <laughs> you.